Planescape is a setting published by TSR in 1994 for second edition Dungeons & Dragons. Its designer was David Zeb Cook and it is primarily based on 1987's Manual of the Plains by Jeff Grubb. The setting came in a box set comprised of four short books and a series of maps. The books were the DM's Guide, Player's Guide, Extended Guide to Sigil, The City of Doors, and Beyond, as well as a brief Monster's Manual. In this video, I'm going to give a brief overview of the DM's Guide, which touches on the various planes themselves. In another video, I'll cover the Player's Guide to the Planes, which covers the unique playable planar races as well as the factions. The first thing worth noticing is the illustrations. The artists earned the setting a lot of praise at the time of publication. The scribbling, sort of Frank Oz style sketches imparted a desperate, dreamlike quality to the books, and was a clear departure from the artwork styles that TSR was using. I'll spare you the one creative conceit in Planescape that can be found in almost every sentence, the planar slang, or cant. It can be interesting to read, but takes some time to really absorb. But I'll say that the cant does impart a unique and frankly brave creative choice that you would never see in a mainstream RPG these days. It's avant-garde. The heart of the setting is the planes themselves. This setting intended to define the entire cosmology of TSR's D&D universe, and included a map of the dimensional network. The map itself divided everything as we know it into several major sections. Due to core elemental and moral alignment properties that define each plane, some spell types work better than others. The setting goes into granular detail on which magics are diminished, nullified, altered, or enhanced depending on which plane your player character is in. If you have a rare spell key, or in the case of priests, a power key, you can circumvent limitations to your magic on a particular plane. Keys come in all shapes and sizes. You'll notice on this table how many planes there are. That's 37 there, and a good number of planes have vast and distinct realms as well. PCs can travel between planes in a number of ways. It should be noted that a planar race is able to travel between some planes at will, whereas any creature from the prime material plane must use one of the artifices here. Spells. A number of spells from D&D 2nd Edition can get you to various planes. Magic items. Examples include an amulet of the planes, a cubic gate, mirror of mental prowess, oil of etherealness, robe of stars, rod of passage, or staff of the magi. Items such as these are often only usable by wizards, have a limited number of uses, or from a meta perspective, be too powerful for a player to simply have without great cost. Vortices. These are only found between the prime material plane and one of the four basic elemental planes of air, earth, fire, and water. They are very stable passageways, but reside in the nature of the element to which they lead, so they're dangerous to use. If you ever find one, they look like a shimmering wall or pool containing the pathway's element. Conduits. These have a few interesting properties. They take you from the prime material plane directly to an outer plane, bypassing the astral plane entirely. There are one-way conduits and two-way conduits. They are invisible, except for maybe a reflective haze. They are always well anchored, and they are fast. Portals. These are pathways to and from the massive city of Sigil, also known as the City of Doors. Portals can connect to any plane at any point. They don't technically pass through any other plane. It's like a point-to-point -point teleportation. They require a special gate key. The key can be a word, an action, or an object. And once activated, there's usually just a flash and a crackle but on the sigil side, they often look like an arched doorway. Much the way the author guides the reader through Planescape like a tour guide, let me be your Virgil as we travel through each of the planes. The Ethereal Plane. This is the planar cocoon that swaddles the inner planes. It's often compared to an ocean with a vast but shallow border zone, and then a deep ethereal that is even more vast, if that can be imagined. Within the ethereal, there is not only the entirety of the inner planes floating around, but demi-planes, which are entire planes that have defined borders and dimensions, like massive cosmic islands. One interesting note is that if you're in the shallow border ethereal, you can still see nearby planes. You're just invisible and inaudible to everyone. You can walk through solid objects and your spells don't work. Inner planes. Inside of the ethereal plane, there are the inner planes, a spherically organized set of infinite dimensions, each containing a primary element. 
there are four elemental planes, air, earth, fire, and water, but also four para-elemental planes, ice, magma, ooze, and smoke, each which lie between the core elements. Then there are eight quasi-elemental planes, lightning, mineral, radiance, stem, ash, dust, salt, and vacuum. On either end of the inner plane sphere is the plane of positive energy and the plane of negative energy. Think of each plane as being a nearly infinite amount of that substance, except that plane is not purely that substance. As you travel closer to a neighboring plane, you will see a gradual mix of the home substance and the next. Furthermore, creatures and deities known as powers have all carved out little niches and strongholds and even cities out of these places, often resorting to bubbles of magically created living space to make them habitable. The more naturally habitable inner planes, such as the plane of air, have an ecosystem of creatures living there without reliance on magic. Most of these planes have no up or down or cardinal direction. At one end of the inner planes, you'll find the positive energy plane, which is an endless landscape of pure burning white light that requires a solid blindfold lest your eyes burn out. Moving through this plane is like swimming in electricity, and you take about as much damage while there. To put it in the author's words, if the total damage reaches twice the traveler's original, he bursts into incandescent flames as the overabundance destroys him from within. It's bright. The negative plane is likewise a vast landscape of darkness that sucks the life out of you in seconds, and once dead, your spirit is unrecoverable by any means, and your remaining husk becomes a wandering undead, eager to feed on the living world. Prime Material Plane This is where you were probably born. Matter here collects into planets, moons, stars, and other bits, and is surrounded by an amber substance called phlogiston. You can actually sail through this substance through a process known as spell jamming. The Prime Material Plane contains worlds like Toril and Kryn, and is essentially the cradle of most of TSR's individual settings. This plane sits upon the edge of the Ethereal Plane, which is the way to the inner planes, as well as the astral plane, which is the way to the outer planes. The astral plane, also known as the silver void, the astral plane looks mostly empty, but somewhat common are so-called color pools that shimmer in prismatic hues. They are all pathways to the outer planes. When you pass through one, it's like pushing through warm molasses. Another major feature of the astral plane are the Githyanki, a race of dirigible faring warriors who have made their home on huge nodules of floating material and who hunt astral whales. The astral plane also contains the floating decaying corpses of ancient deities, or powers. When visiting the astral, you occupy a pale copy of yourself, your true body being left behind at one of your previous destinations. Outer Planes the outer planes are where most of the action is in Planescape. Getting there should be hard, or at least a little weird, but once you're there, the real weird begins. There are some interesting core features of the outer planes. You can walk and breathe on most of the planes without any magical assistance. The mountains seem bigger and the deserts hotter and the colors more vibrant than they are in the material plane, and it can still be hard to get from plane to plane, as they are separated by vast distances and mystic barriers but portals, conduits, color pools, and vortices are instantaneous. You can also get around via sailing down the giant river Oceanus, or the dangerous river Styx, or climbing along the roots and branches of the world-sized tree known as Yggdrasil, or navigating the caves of the impossibly massive Mount Olympus. The River Oceanus Starting on the plain of Elysium, this fragrant, utterly calm river is as wide as an ocean and connects all of Elysium's layers. Unlike any normal river, this one continuously flows in and out of existence, and connects a number of planes together. You can usually find a boat for hire to take you somewhere. The River Styx, a dark purple river that bubbles and churns through the top layers of Acheron, Bator, Gehenna, the Grey Waste, Cerceri, the Abyss, and Pandemonium. The water smells foul, and any touch or taste of it could erase all of the memories of your current life including class, alignment, and spells. Even if you make the saving throw, you lose all memories of the past day. Boats are often getting sucked under, but no trip takes more than a day. Just make sure you have the proper payment for the boatman. 
Yggdrasil. The world ash Yggdrasil stems from Isgard, but has roots and branches that reach to many other planes, even through the astral plane and into the prime material plane. To get anywhere, you must scale its roots and branches. Mount Olympus. Rising in Arborea, the rocky veins of this mountain's roots reach Gehenna, the Grey Waste, and Carceri, but it does not reach any of the inner planes. Its caverns contain color portals, but finding the one that you're looking for is challenging. The Abyss. This is a plane of a possibly infinite number of layers, and it is filled with creatures of utterly evil chaos. The top layer is the Plane of Infinite Portals, a barren, dark land baking under a huge red sun. The landscape is dotted with holes that lead to lower levels of the plane. Each of the other planes are either endless deserts of baking sand, salt or rust, or barren plains of ice, or even seas of acid or lava. Acheron. This is a plane of enforced order, ruled by a culture of blind conformity. It is made of gargantuan blocks of smooth black material drifting through space and occasionally smashing into each other. Its inhabitants, or petitioners, are warriors who are at endless war, constantly mustering, drilling, and fighting, trying to force each other to conform to the other's idea of order. They fill the insides of the world-sized metal blocks with their broken instruments of war, including flying ships, spell jammers, catapults, cannons, and contraptions not seen or conceived of on the prime material plane. Arborea is the home of the Greek pantheon, whose home realm of Olympus embraces an eternity of singing and partying. The plane is also known as Arvindor by the elves, whose own pantheon of gods live here in a separate realm called Asa or Aqualor. The mountains are steep, distances vast, and points of entry relatively few into this paradise of a plane. Arcadia. Known as the land of perfect good, everything grows in straight rows. Fields are geometrically straight, daylight comes from an orb hovering above the tallest mountain, and light changes to dark instantly each night. Evil creatures are treated with great hostility by squadrons of petitioner militia. Although there are three layers, only Marduk and Mount Clangedon are known. The city of Marduk, named after the deity Marduk, has so much order that even the Thieves' Guild operates under its own strict laws and regulations. Mount Clangedon is filled with the Dwarven Halls, forges and armories, and is shaped as a perfect cone. Bator, also known as the Nine Hells, this is the home of the Beatazu, devils of extreme power. The petitioners of Bator suffer eternal torment at the hands of these creatures. Each day their broken, burnt carcasses are reformed and put through the same process of torturous labor all over again. Each of the nine layers of this plane have their own distinct characteristics that I won't go into here for the sake of brevity. Needless to say, it sucks here. The Beast Lands. This plane is not only rich with wild animals, when you visit, your petitioner form must be an animal. There are no towns, cities, or settlements. But you're in luck if you're looking for vast, veldt, jungle, swamp, plains, or forest. The three realms are Krigala, where it is always noon, sunny, and hot. Brux, where it is always dawn, cool, and misty. And Karasuthra, a land of nature in perpetual night. Bitopia. These are the twin paradises. Two flat realms filled with mountains, streams, forests, meadows, and petitioners who work hard and keep to themselves. What's peculiar is that the two realms are sandwiched towards each other, and between the two realms of Dothion and Shurok, their tallest mountains actually touch. When looking up at night, you're not seeing stars, but rather the torches and fireplaces of your petitioner neighbors in the other realm. Carceri, also known as Tartarus, this is the land of exiles, outcasts, the defeated. Even titans are trapped here, and some powers call this their home. The six realms are nested inside of each other like wooden dolls. Each of the realms is hostile to life, filled in turn with quicksand, acid, steep drops, black snow, and bitter cold. Elysium, a plane with no order or discipline, but rather a driving nature towards good, the land is fertile, and the natural beauty is unsurpassed among the outer plains. 
All petitioners live in abundance and peace. The four realms are Amoria, Aronia, Valyrin, and Thalassia, each filled with impossibly beautiful landscapes and interlinked by the great river Oceanus. Gehenna. Volcanoes peaking, both at top and bottom, floating in a void, are what constitute as a landscape in this plane. Choking gases fill the air, and petitioners must cling to mountainsides or fall into oblivion. No one here understands the concept of charity or doing something for nothing. The Grey Waste, also called Hades. This is the hot zone for the fabled Blood War, an ancient struggle between demons and devils in the Outer Plains. Everything is grey the land, the sky, and even the petitioners who just despair at everything with a thousand mile stare. The realms are Oinos, Nilfheim, aka Hell, and Pluton, all bleak. Limbo. It's not clear if Limbo has layers, since it is a roiling mess of the four core elements swirling about in a vast weightless void. You get around by willing yourself to move, so the stronger your mind is, the faster and farther you will go. Petitioners here can change their form to match the elements themselves, but can only transform themselves into naturally occurring formations and objects. Mechanus, also known as Nirvana, or the Clockwork Universe. This is a world of giant cogs that hover through space. The cogs can be as big as hundreds of miles across. The realm Regulus most represents the spirit of Mechanus, being home to Modrons and the power Primus a deity of regimented order. But some real-world cultures have been conspicuously stuffed in this plane as well. The realm of Anu is the home of the Babylonian pantheon, and the realm of the Jade Palace is the home to the celestial bureaucracy, which contains the whole Chinese pantheon. Who knew? Mount Celestia, also known as the Seven Heavens. This plane is structured as a single mountain, and each realm sits along its slopes. Petitioners take the form of Archons, angel-like creatures, and work their way up a hierarchy of Archondom until they become one with the plane itself. The society is entrenched in justice and mercy, and each realm going up the slope of the mountain is increasingly bright and intense until it peaks in a realm that no one has ever returned from. Pandemonium. The least inhabited of the outer plains, this plane is an endless cave system filled with violent and random winds. Isgard, also known as Gladsheim, this plane is home to giant flowering rivers of earthen materials flowing through space. The chunks range in size from boulders to entire continents, and occasionally collide with each other. It is home to the Norse pantheon, with Odin ruling all. Its petitioners are always looking to battle and if they perish, they rise the next day to fight again. The realms here are the eponymous Isgard, and the other two which are as inhospitable to life as they are hard to pronounce, the Outlands. Centered in the middle of the ring of the 16 outer planes, the Outlands take on the characteristics of each plane that it is close to. Creatures live on this vast plateau and build towns and villages that also take on the characteristics of their closest neighboring plane. Sigil. Described and explained in much greater detail than can be given in this video, Sigil is the city of doors that acts as a vast hub between all of the planes for the entire cosmology. It is an urban setting that conveniently provides a way for you to get from place to place without too much transit narration. You can get to almost anywhere from Sigil, so to control Sigil would be to control the multiverse. But the reason it isn't overtaken by some demon Archduke of the Outer Plane is that it is guarded by a mysterious and utterly ruthless godlike entity called the Lady of Pain, who floats through the streets and brutally quells any sign of upheaval. With all due respect to Jeff Grubb and the team who started it all in 1987 with Manual of the Planes for AD&D, Planescape brought something more to the table with largely the same material. The books that make up Planescape are clearly a classic, you get that feeling in the first page or two of the DM's Guide to the Plains. The conversational tour guide writing style filled with brash, planar jargon combined with the mad scribbling artwork style make for a very unique experience. Jeff Grubb and two other head writers attempted a manual of the Plains again in 2001 for third edition D&D, but did not capture